The Ivy House, Market Day, by Catherine Kim. Read by Catherine Kim. Dane frowned over the text in front of him, then turned his frown to the unlit candle past that. The leaves on the vines by the window whispered wordless encouragement. Axe was somewhere out of the house, doing something. He had left as soon as he had Dane settled with the text after breakfast. Dane never knew exactly what he did when he headed out, but often he would bring small game home to eat, and he swore he made no trouble for anyone. A part of Dane wanted to worry about Axe, out there in the supposedly haunted woods alone, but then... He had never heard of monsters in these woods. Well, no stories from anyone who had actually seen one, just those sorts of drunken stories his brothers heard at the pub. The only experience he had was with something unseen and unheard that frightened his brothers off from the ivy-covered house and had not left so much as a footprint for Dane to find, which had turned out to be Axe anyhow, so he refused to worry about it further. A crow landed on one of the low, swooping vines crossing the nearest window where it stood open and tipped its dark head at him as if watching and waiting for this would-be magic user to do something fantastic. Perhaps it wasn't used to anyone in this house aside from Axe, though he seemed not so much to live here as to visit daily, Dane had no idea where the man slept, and was curious as to this presumptuous human daring to reach above his station. Poor crow just might see him set himself on fire instead if it kept distracting him. Another whisper of sound from the vines and a soft noise from the crow startled him out of this mental wandering. He shook his head to gather his thoughts back to the candle. Reading the text again, he sighed and put the book carefully aside, so only the candle remained on the table. It seemed wise to put burnable things well out of range of his attempts. He took a deep breath to soothe himself before going back over the steps in the book and clearing his mind. Again. Magic, it seemed, was at least half intention and willpower, and nearly everything else was the magic inherent to the person casting the spell. The chants and potions and magical tools were merely ways to focus the mage's will and direct his magic. The less inherent power or determination the caster had, the more they needed to rely on the tools and trappings. Dane may have had his doubts about his magical abilities, but he had plenty of determination and patience to practice. And the house had chosen him, after all, right? He could do this, at least. Whether he needed the props or not was immaterial. He could do this. The air in the room stilled. Then he cast his command to the fire. There was a moment of silence. Then the soft woof of flame leaping off the wick with no splint or fire steel. Dane gasped and startled backwards, nearly tipping himself over in his chair. The crow made an odd noise, and if Dane didn't know better, he would have sworn the animal was laughing at him. All very well for you, bird, but I wasn't at all convinced it would work. It hasn't the past two days, he muttered, setting his chair back and blowing the candle out to try it again. He was sitting back down when the bird hopped off the vine and onto the windowsill. Dane blinked at the forward behavior from a wild bird. Then, before he could frown further, the bird flapped its wings, hopped further into the room, and in a blink of thought, Axe stood before him, grinning. I can't see why you would doubt yourself. You've done everything you've set your mind to thus far, Axe said with a grin, as if the past five minutes were anything like normal. Dane, are you well? I... how... what are you? Dane stuttered once he found his voice again. Axe tipped his head in confusion. I thought we had already discussed that. I am... was... well, Axe shrugged. I am your familiar. Dane blinked at the man, now clearly human-looking at least, in his dark leather boots and his plain traveler-style clothing. Dane had taken to thinking of Axe's hair as hazel. Much like the man's eyes, a rich, earthy brown with glimmers of green and gold. As a human, Axe was a giant of a man, tall and broad and stronger than even the blacksmith in Dane's old village. And Dane was unable to begin to understand how his new friend could become something as small as a common crow. He wondered for a moment if he had gone mad. But he wasn't mad. He knew he had seen a crow, a perfectly ordinary, unremarkable bird, turn into this solid, frowning man in front of him. Dane had thought he had a great deal to learn from the books on the shelves, but clearly there were more urgent lessons to learn first. Tell me what that means, he finally managed to say. Tell me everything. X took his usual seat and frowned now at his fingers, where they rubbed against each other on the table. He cleared his throat. How much is everything? Dane blinked, then frowned at the question. I... I ask, because there is so much, and I am not proud of all of it. And, Axe grimaced, and it makes a difference if it is an order or not. Dane flinched back as if dodging a blow. An order? He had been here for three days now, mostly cleaning and learning a little about the previous residents of the house. 
Some of them had been good, some had not. Some had lived in the house for a lifetime, some only for a year or two, or in one case, a few short months, according to Axe's stories. Axe had not been here for the whole existence of the house, however, so he didn't know who had originally built it, nor where its magic came from. But not once since he had come here had Dane felt like he was in charge of anything in particular. They spoke together as new acquaintances do, about small things and preferences for meals and weather and work. Axe told him of the history of the house, and occasionally advised him on texts to read to learn more. Dane told him what little he could remember of his mother and about things he had once daydreamed about. Dane enjoyed learning and reading, and now that he wasn't being forced into menial tasks by his brother's spite, he found he enjoyed keeping his own home tidy and pleasant. He even enjoyed the cooking now that he was able to eat the food hot and fresh with good company. Axe preferred being outside, and often disappeared for hours at a stretch, returning for a meal or to lock the house for the night. He never tried to enter the bedroom with Dane, and he was always awake when Dane went to sleep, and either eating or preparing to leave when he woke in the morning. He seemed to prefer the outdoor chores and tended the fruit trees scattered around the woods nearby and hunted game for them to eat, and that seemed a suitable enough division of tasks. But it wasn't one Dane had decreed. It was simply how they fell to sharing the space. But now? Now Axe forced him to confront his position. Axe had not referred to his supposedly subordinate position again since the morning Dane had accepted a place here. But if Axe was speaking the truth, then Dane was the master here, and had every right to order Axe to tell him anything he pleased to know, to do any task Dane could think to set for him. The idea made Dane shiver and his stomach sour. Tell me, Dane said at last, his voice quiet but steady, if you are willing to tell me at least, what can you do? That... Seems like something I should know. Axe's dark eyes flashed up to meet Dane's, surprise and gratitude clear in them. He nodded. That's true enough. And perhaps I should have told you as much already. It has been some time since Lessa passed away, and she was here for so long that I had not thought of it. I am sorry. Dane shook his head. No, don't be. I didn't think to ask either. And I apologize for my reaction just now. I was surprised, that's all. Axe smiled at that. Indeed. Well. As you noticed, I have more than one form. This one and the crow, and others which are more suited for any fighting I must do. The crow form is very useful for most things you would require, and I enjoy it. But sometimes the house or my masters require something a bit more intimidating. Axe shrugged. Is that what you do? You act as a guard? Dane asked. Axe sighed. Not exclusively, though I am one of the layers of protection wrapped around you now. Axe gestured at the candle, then nodded at the bookshelf. When you begin doing more advanced and dangerous magic, you will need assistance. Sometimes you will channel your magic through me, and I will act as the focus for your spellwork. Sometimes you will take magic from me if you need more. Axe shrugged again as if he were discussing the loan of a tool or a few hours' simple labor. Dane had not tried any spells until now. Not even the simplest he could find, because the first thing the text said was that to use magic was to tap into one's own life force. The power that made the spells work at all came from an exchange of life, which was why so many mages lived in wild areas. Being surrounded by nature and growing things helped defray the cost of casting. Dane understood it to mean that the plants surrounding the house would help power his spells since they could easily renew their energy. He couldn't begin to understand what channeling a spell through another creature would do to it. Taking power from another sentient being, even one who was willing, felt violent and wrong. Axe, he murmured. It is a familiar's duty, Axe said gently. And I seem to be essentially immortal, so I have plenty of energy to spare for a few spells. Finally, I will do any task that you set for me, to the best of my ability. That, too, is my duty. There seemed something in Axe's voice that gave Dane pause. Something about how he spoke, the inflection and emphasis in his words caught in Dane's mind, and he turned the possible meanings over. You have been asked to do things you did not wish to, he said softly. Axe glanced back up to meet Dane's gaze, then lowered his eyes again and nodded. It is, then, less my duty and more the geese. Traditionally, familiars are able to refuse orders, and they do so to balance and guide their mages. I am compelled to obey, regardless of my feelings on the matter, and resistance is... inadvisable. Dane felt his eyes grow wide as the implication settled in. Are you... that is, can... He wasn't certain what he wanted to ask, let alone how to ask it. Finally, he settled on a statement instead. I don't want you to be forced to do anything you don't want to do. I don't want to coerce you, Axe smiled. It was a small, almost uncertain expression, and it didn't suit his face. Thank you.
You don't believe me, Dane said. Axe didn't answer. Dane thought for a moment. I doubt very much that I will be giving orders often, if ever, Dane said, and the look of polite disbelief on Axe's face said enough. I am sure you mean that, Axe said before Dane could object, but I have lived a very long time and had many masters now. You should not make promises that you do not know you can keep. Dane narrowed his eyes and glared. Very well, then, I have an order for you. Axe raised an eyebrow and waited silently. If at any time I tell you to do something you object to, tell me, clearly, and with your reasons why. Axe gasped. Is that clear enough an order? Dane asked. He sat up tall with his head held high and put as much imperiousness into the question as he could. To be fair, that wasn't much. Axe blinked at him and nodded, then, almost as an afterthought, softly murmured, I understand, master. I have been here for two weeks now. We need supplies that you can't hunt for. Axe stood in the doorway, mulishly refusing to move. It's too dangerous. You've barely mastered a handful of spells. I'm fairly sure that I won't need to light any candles when buying flour. And a cow or a goat would be good. Perhaps some chickens. Not that we have anywhere to house them at the moment. Dane gazed out the window by the stove and imagined a small goat pen and a chicken coop, and beside that, a small vegetable garden. There was a book of potions as well, so an herb garden seemed practical on that side of his new life. What do we need animals for? I can hunt for you easily enough. Dane brought his attention back inside the house and sighed. I have already been over the reasons with you. It is market day. I found a few coins and have some things to trade that you promised me weren't too valuable or enchanted. It makes no sense to stay here and go hungry when there is no need to. He paused and frowned. Unless there's something you aren't telling me. Axe scowled. Dane raised an eyebrow and stared back, no longer intimidated by his friend's grumbling. Your brothers are still searching for you. Axe sighed finally. I have been watching them, and they have worked themselves into a rage that you ran away from them. Your eldest brother seems particularly incensed. Dane didn't even bother to ask when or why Axe was spying on his brothers. He didn't have the energy, suddenly, to delve into that particular topic. When did you plan to tell me this? Did you intend to simply watch them plotting while we hide in the woods until they get enough of their friends together to seek us out? We wait for Jeremy's frightened band of would-be trackers to come get us? Dane waved his arms for emphasis and gestured around the house. This place is not a fortress, Axe. All it would take is one well-thrown torch and they will win. The shutters creaked and Axe's scowl grew deeper. Of course not. I intended to let them gather their group and then pick them off one by one as they made their way through the forest. Besides, both the house and the woods themselves have defenses of their own. The house moves around and shields itself. The forest leads people astray at a whim. It is unlikely that your brothers would ever even find this place again, let alone be able to harm it. Axe shrugged. And do you truly believe that a mage's home would burn so easily? Dane stared at him, then glared at the fireplace, having no real idea where the house itself could be glared at. The hearth was as good a place as any to be designated the face. The air in the room stirred lightly, and the leaves on the vines muttered to themselves, as if the house was feeling a bit sheepish, so it must have worked well enough. I would hope that one of you would have alerted me to the danger at some point, perhaps when someone needed to go out and clean up the bodies, or find your body, Axe? Dane turned his glare back to his friend. I may be young, and I may be poorly trained still, but I am involved in this. I need to know when there is a threat, and I still need to go out and get supplies, which makes half this argument moot. Dane stomped over to the workbench, where he had been setting out the things he intended to take into the market to sell. A few books of small value in coin or in content. Some old tools that he couldn't use and Axe assured him weren't related to his magical studies. A few household odds and ends that weren't necessary or were duplicated. He started carefully placing them in his satchel and a basket he had scrounged from under his bed. Once he felt settled enough to explore outside his new home, the vines that had covered everything when he discovered the house had pulled back, and he could see that the walls were stone and wood. Also, he saw that the roof was still solid and whole, and there was a shed that stuck out from the side of the house at an awkward angle, which helped to hide it, and held a number of tools and useful items. He planned to take the small handcart he discovered in the back of the shed, past a stack of empty grain sacks to carry his market purchases home. You insist on going to the market where your brothers or their cronies could easily catch you? Axe's outrage rang clear through the room. The house creaked, adding its own note of concern. I know it is the next village over from the one you were raised in, but it is still close enough. This house is close enough! They showed up just a few hours after I did, remember? We need supplies. Unless I can magically conjure things from the air, then yes, 
I plan to go to the market. Dane didn't stop what he was doing, wrapping the books in a cloth to protect them from dust on the road. And last I read, that particular skill has eluded even the most skilled of mages. So I suggest you get accustomed to the idea. I'm going with you, Axe growled. Naturally you're coming with me, Dane huffed in exasperation. He glanced back over his shoulder to see Axe glowering at him. I did not plan to go alone. That would be beyond foolish. Axe made a strangled scoffing noise, but a short time later, Dane was walking out the door. As he passed through, a vine swept over and brushed against his arm. I'll be fine, he reassured the house, truly. And think about where you would allow some small animal pens. I wouldn't want to upset you with them. The leaves rustled as a vine brushed his arm again, and a tendril wrapped around his wrist. He watched in amazement as it circled his wrist several times, wrapping and curling around itself until he wore a slim vine bracelet, and the rest of the vine dropped away detached. He ran a finger lightly over the tiny leaves that sprouted from it and now looked like a finely wrought chain, and blinked. You wish to come with us as well? Dane asked softly, and the vines ruffled gently against each other in reply. He had to swallow to clear his throat before he went on. Thank you. I will be careful, I promise. He turned and hefted the cart's handles, and Axe cawed loudly and flew ahead into the woods. An hour or so later, Dane emerged from the shade beneath the trees and stepped cheerfully along the path they had found not long after setting out. Dane could smell the river, and his heart thrilled. He had never been this far from the house he was born in before, and finally seeing the bustling port town with his own eyes was every bit as amazing as he had thought it would be. He pulled his cart to a small inn at the edge of town that seemed to do a fair business in watching carts and horses while their owners went further into the market, and after paying a coin to the boy there, he slung his pack over his shoulder and hefted the basket. Directions to a bookseller was his first question, and hearing the crow calling from just ahead gave him more confidence than he expected. He was surprised to find that he easily knew which of the dark birds gathered on the rooftops was his friend, but even if he hadn't, Axe had shocked him a bit earlier by somehow calling to him in his mind. It hadn't been words spoken so much as he had suddenly and simply known what Axe was trying to communicate, and, after stumbling and nearly falling all over the path in his shock, had taken him almost the whole rest of the walk to master the silent communication. He was glad to not be alone, even as excited as he was. The bookseller was in an older part of the town, away from the market square, down a narrow street behind a tavern. The sounds of the street faded a bit, the clamor of traders shouting and travelers meeting up, muffled by the corner of the building. Axe fluttered to rest on the eve of the two-story building. Dane smiled up at him and ducked inside, greeted by the dusty, papery, leathery scent of books. There was a comfort to the smell, and as his eyes adjusted to the dimness of the room, from the bright sunlight outside, he saw row after row of shelves towering over him and lined with every size of book he could imagine. Stacks of books sat in corners like children playing hide-and-seek, and past the corner of one far shelf he could see the arm of a chair. Welcome, young'un! Come in, come in! A portly older woman with short hair the color of rich earth perched on a stool near a long counter. She had a basket full of cloth at her feet, and her hands were busy sewing a patch onto what looked like maybe a shirt, but it was folded into her lap so Dane wasn't sure. She seemed the picture of contentment. "'Good day, mistress,' he said, ducking his head. "'Good day, young'un. What brings you to this dusty old shop on such a fine day?' She rested her work on her lap to smile at him. "'I have some books I hope to sell. I have moved into a small abandoned house nearby. The previous owner passed some time ago, and I was assured that I could,' Dane said, suddenly nervous. "'I can't use all of their things, and hope that someone else can benefit from what I cannot.' "'A house nearby, hmm?' The woman's expression never changed, but her gaze seemed to sharpen. "'Well, bring them here, then. Let's have a look.' Dane did as he was bid, and pulled the books from his pack, laying them gently on the counter. The woman hopped down and stowed her mending away in a corner, then bent over the books. After several minutes, she straightened. I can't offer you much for these, I'm afraid. They're old, and they're not terribly uncommon, she said. I know, but every bit will help. I am still setting up and filling the cupboards, Dane answered. I know it is late, but I thought to start a garden, and I need to buy seeds and such. And butter and eggs and the like, I have no doubt, she answered. She rummaged behind the counter and came back with a small sack, from which she pulled several coins. Well, for this lot I can offer you two and a half silvers and not a copper more. Her voice was firm, but her eyes held the smile she had worn since he stepped in. That's plenty, mistress. I have a few other things to trade in other stalls. Oh, call me Meg, the woman said, waving her hand at him as if shooing away the title itself. My mother named me after the great Queen Margaret, but I don't think anyone but her ever called me that. Meg chuckled, and the warm sound cheered Dane. She still does to this day, and I think it's out of sheer orneriness. He smiled at that. I am Dane. It, I'm honored to know you, Meg. Her smile broadened, and he would swear that she nodded very slightly in approval. 
Well, young Master Dane, I trust you will have success in your endeavors, Meg said. You be careful on the road, though. There have been some reports of thieves and lowlifes recently. The town watch will root them out soon enough, I'm sure, but keep a sharp eye on your purchases on your way back into the woods. You hear me? You're young enough to seem like easy prey to fools like that. Dane blinked. Her smile had faded, and she looked at him with the sort of concern he had seen on the faces of mothers scolding their children in his old village. Yes, Meg, I will, he answered. Good. Now, she nodded. Now why don't you tell me a bit about yourself? It's been some time since I had the chance to gossip with someone new. Meg retrieved her mending and settled back onto her stool as they chatted, and Dane eventually left the shop with the feeling of having found a new friend. It was strange and wonderful, and he felt light as air as he went about the rest of his business in the market. Meg had promised to have spice cakes next market day if he was inclined to stop by to chat again. He absolutely would. And perhaps he could take her something as well. He did the rest of his business quickly, easily selling the rest of the things he had brought and then seeking out the supplies he wanted. By late afternoon he was finished, and sat on the edge of his cart, chewing on a small traveler's cake and washing it down with ale from the inn. He tossed a portion of the cake to Axe, who sent him a scoffing, grumbling impression that he wasn't a wild bird to be wooed with crumbs, and then ate the offering anyway. Dane laughed and tipped his face to the sun for the simple pleasure of the day. Flour and eggs and three chickens in a small wicker cage, along with a sack of grain for them to eat. Some seeds and a great deal of advice on autumn gardening were also included in his acquisitions. And Dane had dutifully taken notes in a small sheaf of paper, much to the great amusement of the stallkeeper. Dane just grinned at the man's chuckles and stuffed his notes in his pocket. All in all, it was a successful day, and he was tired and happy and full of the contentment of a day well spent. It was not long after he finished his small meal that he was on the path heading back to his ivy house the bracelet on his wrist brushing over his skin. It was a lovely day, sunny and bright with a bit of a breeze to keep him from being too warm. Axe was nearby and his home was with him for company, and for the first time he had been to a market and not had to scurry as quickly as he could to get his errands completed while avoiding his brothers and their friends. He had been able to look at everything, and chat with folk, and enjoy himself as he completed his tasks, and Dane's heart felt full from it all. He was just stepping under the late afternoon shade of the trees when Axe cawed loudly in warning. Dane stopped and glanced up to where he thought his friend was, but was distracted by a low, ugly chuckle. Well, well. I thought Jeremy and Boren would have found your scrawny ass by now. Dane's jaw clenched, and he turned to look behind him. Two of his brother's friends stood there, just behind the cart, and hidden from the town by the edge of the woods, grinning. He remembered the one who spoke well enough. Dane thought his actual name was Tom but his brothers more often called him Dump when he came around to lend a hand on the farm and eat and drink far too much after. Looks like it's their bad luck. Now we get him for a bit, said the other. Dane couldn't remember his name at all, but he had also come to the farm several times. Think we could have that stew tonight, the one with those delicious little dumplings? You did enjoy that stew last we were out there, didn't you? He'll make what we tell him to make, Dump said with a leering grin. We'll return you back to your brothers eventually, don't worry, boy. Unless we can convince him to let us keep you. But I think we've earned a reward for finding you first either way. He stepped forward, and Dane stepped back, leaving the small comfort of the cart. If he had to run for it, the cart would slow him down, and there was nothing he couldn't replace, though he would feel badly about the chickens. Old habits had him cowering away, however, instead of simply taking off running as he should have. Cold panic gripped his chest. Dump stalked forward and grabbed Dane's arm before he could dodge away. Now then, boy, we'll have you back to our place in hardly any time at all, and you can get started on dinner. Then tomorrow you can clean the place up nice. I'll let Jeremy know I've got you in hand eventually. Grab the cart, Jan. We'll take whatever he's got in there with us. If these two got him back to the hut they shared with at least one more thug, Dane had the feeling they would be even less pleasant than his brother's. Get your hand off me, Dump, Dane tried to growl, but he was afraid it came out as more of a squeak when Dump just laughed. Hey, fellas. Axe's voice came from behind the other man. What seems to be going on here? Ain't nothing here for a stranger to butt into. We just found a lost lamb and are taking him home. Dump leered again at him and Dane squeaked. I said let me go! He tried to free his arm, but Dump's grip was like iron. Sounds like the lamb is happier away from wolves like you, so perhaps you could run along now. Axe was giving them a chance and they were too dumb to know it. Dane yanked on his arm again uselessly. Nosy people risk their noses the other man said, and brayed his stupid laugh before swinging at Axe with a meaty fist. These two weren't that bright, nor were they especially pleasant, but they were big, bigger than his brothers, which was saying something. Dump, he knew, was a blacksmith's youngest son, who had found a life in a hut well outside the village taking odd work for coin to be more suited to his temperament than smithing. Dane thought he remembered the other man had grown up on a farm, and he certainly had a farmhand's build. Axe was larger still, however, and faster. And Dane suspected... 
possessed a great deal more fighting experience than both these fools put together, and then doubled. Axe stepped easily out of the way of Jan's fist, and cracked his own out to land a brutal blow to the side of his head. Jan went down like a tumbling statue, and lay still in the dust behind the cart. Jan! Dump shouted before shoving Dane also into the dust of the path. You'll regret that. You should have kept to your own business! Dump puffed himself up like a rooster ready for a fight. Axe, meanwhile, was all unmoved calm and loose posture. He seemed more like he was out for a stroll to spend a lazy afternoon fishing than participating in a roadside brawl. He simply smiled and turned to look at Dump, then glanced past him to Dane. Are you injured, young master? Dane shook his head to clear it and rubbed at his arm where Dump had held him. He knew full well that he would bruise from that grip. He grimaced slightly at the pain, and when he looked up, he saw the understanding in Axe's eyes. At Dump's wordless snarl, Dane suddenly realized. Axe was not merely using a common courtesy title for an unfamiliar youth as a pretense. He was acknowledging Dane's superior importance. He was asserting Dane's authority over Dump, rather than the other way around, and Dump, having been around a wider variety of people than Dane, had caught the slight. Dump rushed at Axe and swung his fist, aiming for Axe's face. Axe once again stepped aside and let the blow slide past. I've been in drunken brawls with more skilled opponents, he taunted. At least they had the excuse of liquor for their poor technique. Dump tried again, and again, and each time Axe simply moved out of the way as if it was the easiest thing in the world. After several minutes, Dump was snarling and puffing like a wounded beast, and Axe finally sighed and whirled as Dump stumbled past him again and brought down his fist onto Dump's back, dropping him onto the ground beside his friend. Axe brushed his shirt down smooth again and shook his head sadly. I'm honestly a bit disappointed. I'm well out of practice, but these two made everything so easy. It's been at least sixty years since I've gotten to brawl, and was almost looking forward to a bit of fun, but that was just sad. He turned to Dane and offered his hand with a smirk. Well, Master Dane? Thank you, Dane said, accepting the help to his feet again. You could have easily escaped them, you realize. I held back to see if you would, Axe said. He put his hands around Dane's waist and lifted him to sit in the cart before putting himself between the handles and lifting them. Dump is larger than even Jeremy. I could never beat them. Even if I knew anything about fighting, which I don't. Dane wasn't trying to sound pathetic. But he had never been able to fight back against his brothers. How could he stand up against anyone else? It was simply not possible, X scoffed. That was before you came here. Ruffians like that? You have skills now that they couldn't begin to imagine, let alone fight back against, and this is simply the start of your journey. Dane blinked at him. What possible good is lighting a candle or moving papers and feathers against a huge brute like that? I would be crushed to a pulp before my pitiful candle trick could light my imminent doom. A path opened to their left, and Axe maneuvered the cart onto it with a sigh. After a long moment, Dane glanced behind them and saw nothing but forest. He turned back to Axe when the cart stopped and found the man turned to look at him. A candle is the only thing that can burn? Axe asked. Of course not. Well then, Axe reached out and gently wrapped his fingers around Dane's wrist to lift it from his lap and hold it between their bodies. How do you suppose a candle flame could help you here? Assuming I had nefarious plans for you. Dane frowned at Axe's fingers, then back up at the man and shook his head. Axe sighed again. What happens if you get your fingers too close to a candle flame? He raised his eyebrows expectantly, as if teaching a toddler. I burn- Oh! Dane blinked down at the hand holding his wrist. He felt slow and foolish as he spoke again. I burn my fingers. Fire burns, even small fires. I could have burned Dump's fingers. Or even set his sleeve alight. Now you're thinking. Axe sounded pleased, and when Dane looked up again, he was grinning widely. Dane smiled now as well, and with a thought, flipped a falling leaf into Axe's face. He laughed when Axe sputtered and swiped it away and glared at him without any heat. You also have this, don't forget. Axe reached out and touched a finger to the bracelet of vines the house had given him. The leaves seemed to almost preen under the touch. There is a great deal of magic in here as well, and it will respond to your command if you ask it to, or provide a bit of extra power should you need it and I am not there. I think I understand. Dane grinned for a moment longer before he turned thoughtful. I've never... I could never win a fight against my brothers. It was smarter simply not to try. That's why I ran away in the first place. I couldn't fight them. But neither could I stay there and suffer any more. But now... Now you have skills they don't. You don't have to be bigger or stronger to win a fight. Just more clever. Aren't there many stories of single human heroes slaying giants and defeating monsters? Saving entire kingdoms? They don't do it by overpowering the beasts, do they? Axe laid a hand on Dane's shoulder and squeezed gently. Warmth bloomed in Dane's chest and his smile returned. 
It was satisfying to see you lay those two out, though, Dane said. Axe cracked a laugh and joined him in his merry mood before turning to pull the cart again. They fell into a conversation about what Dane had purchased and how many coins he had left, his plans for the chickens and the animals he wanted to buy at the next market day, and the garden he wanted to prepare before the change of seasons, and Dane felt his smile growing the whole trip home.